Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to the 2024 Influential You podcast. My name is Josh D'Amigo, and I'm an Influential You consultant, senior program faculty member, and host of this podcast. At Influential You, we teach you how to launch, grow, and scale your business and amplify your influence. Since 2009, we've helped thousands of business owners, executives, and entrepreneurs become more influential, more rewarded, and more you. Now, over the last 10 years of this podcast, we've built a collection of stories from individuals who found satisfaction through our advanced education and shared their stories in these interviews. This season, we'll be revisiting some of these classic tales. We'll share original episodes of the Influential You podcast, hosted by our CEO and co-founder, John Patterson, and I'll share some of the key takeaways that I learned from listening to each of these interviews. Today, we'll revisit our first interview with Influential You client, Trisha Tyler. Released in August of 2016, this episode features John's interview with Trisha, where she shares what she learned through our studies on how to increase her value. Now hint, the strategies of increasing your value and the tactics that she shares are still relevant today. So listen closely. During this episode, you'll hear references to Influence Ecology, the original name for our organization, which is another way of saying you are the company you keep, and that is still a big part of what we teach to our clients and teams today. Enjoy this episode, and I'll see you on the other side. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I am your host, John Patterson, the co-founder and CEO of Influence Ecology. We are the leading business education in transactional competence. Broadcasting from Ojai, California, this is the podcast for you, the ambitious professional who simply wants an advantage. And now you won't settle for an ordinary life. You want real results, real satisfaction, not just at work, not just in your career, but in every area of your life. Our primary feature today is an interview with Trisha Tyler of Mercer Health and Benefits. Trisha talks about how to create value for the companies that you work for. One of the reasons I love this interview is that we have members who at first believe that they have no say about their income. They have no way to shape the role that they have with major corporations. And you'll hear that this is simply not true. Trisha is a prime example of being very valued and valuable. And in her spare time, she works to make us all aware of the value of our oceans as she works on ocean conservation with a special love for sharks, one of my favorites. Today, our talk is from our annual member conference in 2015. Our global membership gathers every January for five days in a luxury resort somewhere in the world. Now, this talk, led by co-founder Kirk Tibbles, is about the 2015 theme of the year, which was work, the activity of life. In this talk, you're going to hear why so much of what we are doing may not be valuable to ourselves or to others. Stick around for that. All right. So, Trisha has been a member with Influence Ecology for a little over four years. Trisha, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. What else would you like for us to know about you? You can know that I'm 40 years old, that I've been in my career for close to 17 years, and that I'm newly married. Um, and some of these develops have, developments have happened inside of my study with Influence Ecology and I'm interested to tell you today just a little bit more about how just even my study has impacted not just my career, my money, and and what I get to do on a daily basis, but also just how it's impacted other aspects of my life, you know, even being newly married and, and whatnot. So um, I think this will be a great conversation. Great. And tell us a little bit about uh, what you do now as a senior principal for Mercer. Sure. A lot of my responsibilities relate to managing relationships. So meaning that I am the person who's accountable in most cases for the relationships that we have with our clients. And I also lead teams of people who deliver our services. So our services are employee benefits consulting, talent consulting, retirement consulting. I specialize more in that health and benefit space where we design benefit programs for employers. 
and I lead teams of attorneys, actuaries, project managers, and, and the like to be able to deliver those services. And so ultimately I'm listening for what is the client trying to accomplish, helping identify those solutions for them and pulling that all together from a strategic perspective, and then turning that over to the team to be able to ensure that that gets executed. That's a year round process. So typically when we're included, when we're involved with a client, we're working around a year round calendar with them. And then the whole process kind of starts over, if you will. Mm. So you can see the transaction at work. Um, in what we do, uh, even just kind of in that renewal kind of way, it goes around the calendar. But what I do specifically, I mean, in terms of like the way I utilize my time, I spend a lot of my time now really telling the story to our clients and telling our stories to prospective clients. And so the story is from to a prospective client, it's what we could accomplish together. You know, it's what our services provide that that really addresses issues that they face, you know, breakdowns that they have around you know, how they're utilizing their own staff and people inside their companies or, or also the kinds of savings that we could create in terms of the programs they have and whatnot. And then with clients, it really is moving them to adopt the changes that are going to be required for them to have the future they want. You know, every company wants a certain type of future and they're grappling with their, you know, their situation. And the thing about what we impact is it's intimate to people's lives. You know, we're designing programs that you know, when somebody goes in to see a doctor or when they, you know, fall ill and they have to have a surgery or whatever the situation is, that's the intersection of it. We're not delivering the actual health care itself, but we're designing the program overall. And so it, it's very meaningful to the companies, to the employees and their, their children and their family and all of that kind of stuff. So while it's business oriented and we have to understand the, all the financial underpinnings and the impact to the balance sheet for that client and everything else, it's also intimate in the sense that it can make the difference in the talent that a company can attract and the talent they can keep, but it's also, it impacts them at the level of sometimes what are their greatest vulnerabilities when they're sick or they're ill or they really need, you know, care. So, mm. so it's a very broad spectrum in terms of just all the things that we look at and we need to be mindful of as we work with them. And, and I think my favorite part about it is just, I get to really know clients. I get to know companies. I get to know them in, in a way that I, I'm I'm personally inspired by them. I get I'm really interested in who they are and how they function and and who they want to be. And, you know, and a company has their own identities, and so it's 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 neat to be able to provide something to them that fulfills on the future that they want. And a lot of times, companies just like people are hesitant to change, and so it's being able to really deliver to them the pathway for them to see how they can have that change and they can handle that change and the future will be better and it is, it's just, it's, it's a great experience to get to do that, you know, with executives, with senior level folks and their employees that are on their teams. That's really great. Well, what I'd love to do to start out here is, you know, there's the before and after. Where were you a couple of years back, four years back, if you will, and where are you now in terms of many of those areas that you're here to satisfy? So, so four years ago, I was in a leadership position, a local leadership position for another company. And I was leading a small team of, of folks. And I honestly, I was just, I was working really hard. I mean, I, and I don't mind, I have a background of working hard. It come, you know, I come from four generations of cotton farmers. So hmm. working hard is part of the identity and, and kind of what you grow up in your DNA with. But um, but it was the kind of, it was, it was, it was working in a way that I didn't want to do. I didn't mind the hard working. It was just on the kinds of things I didn't want to do. And it just felt really like labor and um, just wasn't very satisfying. And, and the money that I was making was, wasn't quite making today, but it was definitely a, a quite a bit less than what I was making, especially given I look at the upside potential that I have today. So you have those pieces of it. And just in general, how I was known was for solving some problems, but I think I would get distracted by doing parts of the work that I probably shouldn't have been doing. When I look at my personality type and what I like to do, those things that I like to do, I tend to excel at and I do a really good job. Those things I don't like to do, but I felt like I had to do, that it just came with the territory and it was part of what you're supposed to do. Yeah. I didn't do as well. And so that was a real detraction for me in terms of my actual experience of the work, but it was also just a detraction in my performance. You know, when you looked at my performance, it was like, she's really good here, but she really doesn't do a very good job here. You know, I'm, I, nobody actually ever said that to me, but I have to imagine they said it, you know, so. And you knew it. Uh, 
And I knew it, you know, I lived with that. So knowing that I could be really good in certain areas and just not very good in others. And the difference, if I can say just around that specifically, the difference between then and now is that now I'm, <laughs> I've, I've given up that naive notion that I'm the one who's supposed to do all of those things. And instead is just make myself very valuable to those around me by doing the things I do great and doing a lot more of that and doing that almost exclusively, which is putting me in front of clients, working with people, adopting change, being able to develop the strategic solutions and being the one accountable for when something goes, you know, something isn't according to plan or, or needs really someone who's going to be ultimately accountable and can solve the issue. That stuff I'm highly valuable in and it's really needed. And so by focusing and saying, this is what you can rely on me for, this is what I'm going to do. And finding others who really would prefer to do the other types of more task oriented types of things, things that require, you know, constant follow up or, you know, just, you know, something that in the, in the personality types that we talk about that a producer is more likely to do or excel in doing those things. That's, that's the kind of work I started moving off of my plate and I just got better and better as a result. So I just became more successful in the sense of I was good at the things I was actually at work on and I was giving the things that I wasn't very good at to other people who were a lot more aligned with that or just much better at that. So instead of feeling like I was stuck and I had to do it a particular way, I just started looking around to how could I make this where I'm providing what I'm most valuable at? And it just made a real difference in how I'm viewed, I think, in the value I bring to others around me. I'm thinking about the listeners who work for someone or work in some capacity for another company, and then there are the self-employed. So there's two different kinds of people listening to this. And I know we often get questions about the ability to impact my situation when I'm employed. For example, someone might say, well, I don't have mm -hmm. much say about how much money I make, or I don't have much say about what I do and what I don't do. And most of the self-employed people think they have all the freedom in the world to do that. For the people who are listening and are not self-employed, what would you say to those who say, well, I don't have much say in what I earn and what I do? I would say when you create value for the companies you work for, then you really should be having conversations about being compensated what you're worth. And I think when you create and when you know the value you create and you will become reliable to create that value, that's an important part of it. When you become reliable to be able to create that value, whatever that thing is within your company, and others align with that, they agree with that, they say, yes, you are valuable at that thing, then you want to keep putting yourself in positions where you're doing, mo you're doing more and more of that thing and delivering on it, delivering you know, very consistently around that. And, and I can tell you, there's not a company I work with, so I, I get the opportunity to obviously know the inside of the company I work for, but as part of being a consultant is I get to see inside of lots of companies because those are my clients. And so I would say there's not a company I know that isn't looking for people who can reliably deliver on the thing they say that they're reliable to deliver and that they will figure out a way if it's valuable to them to compensate you for what you're worth. Two, I think the other part of it is thinking about part of it's the money equation and money is a really important element and it's the leading element for most people and the reason why they work, right? That they're going to need their compensation to be in a certain range first and foremost. Yeah. But after that, it's the other aspects. It's the amount of time, the flexibility you have with your time or the flexibility you have to work from other places or making sure you're doing the work that you love or making sure you're doing the work that you want to do with the people you really care about, you know, those types of things. I've just found that as I can articulate what's important to me in all of those different areas, I get to have those types of situations arise, you know, and, and there's certain, even down to the level of there's certain types of clients I, I, I feel like I, I provide a lot of value for. And there are other types of clients that I just don't, I'm not a good match for. And I think at some point for some consultants, maybe they feel like that's a bit of a failure, but for me, it's ideal. Like I know the kind of customer that I'm a really good fit for and I keep seeking them out. And then I have learned to start declining those that I'm just not going to be a good fit for. Um, and that's another way in which I keep increasing the value that I bring because I'm valuable for those certain types of clients and those certain types of personality types and those who have particular kinds of ambitions for a certain type of future and stuff. So that's another way I keep from diluting both my energy and, and, and also just diluting my value because if I'm going to a customer that's not going to really value what I do best, 
then that would be that's just a mistake to to work with them for them and for me. So you speak to value quite a bit in what you just said, and I love that you did so because I think it's one of the defining principles um, for what we teach. We we speak a lot about increasing the value that you offer. Sometimes people go about trying to make more money, or you could say that they're they're at work on something. Not too many people are at work on increasing the value, transacting to elevate, expand the value that they are or are perceived to have for other people. And it, it's something quite fundamental for us and in, in how we teach that. What might you say to those people who don't know how to go about increasing their real or perceived value for the companies that they work or or if they're self-employed? I would first say, what do you like to do inside of your company? And, you know, what do you want to do? And is that something that's needed? I mean, is it just, is it useful? I mean, fundamentally, we define value as it's useful, it's got utility, right? And then the scarcity of that utility. Is everybody able to provide that same usefulness? If so, then it's going to be difficult to really be perceived as highly valuable if everybody can provide it or a lot of people can provide it. So it's really important to look at what are you good at? And one of the first places to start is ask other people. Just a fundamental question, what do you count on me for? In your environment, what people count on you for? They're they're largely putting up with some of the other behaviors you have. And that's part of what I've learned. <laughs> that's part of what I've learned in my fundamentals of transaction courses. Yeah, They've been putting up with a lot of other things because you're very because I was very useful in other ways. So so <laughs> one of the best ways to increase value is just go, what do you count on me for that you really want? And if you really know the person and you really can take it, go, what's the other stuff you got to put up with to be able to get that? Because the more I can remove the stuff that they're just kind of putting up with, which we also call high cost behaviors, yep. the more I can remove those things and those antics and behaviors and whatever you want to call them or reduce them. And the more I can focus on doing the things that they really want to count on me for, I've already increased my value there. And those can be really small steps that can make a big impact. Okay, can you can you take that and then translate that over to someone who's either starting a new company or a, a small business owner? How would you correlate that to that? I would say for someone who's starting a new company, part of especially cuz you get to get to start from a blank slate with the exception of you, right? If I were going to start a new company and I was starting with me, I would start with what's my transactional personality type. There's a type that you train rather in in influence ecology that there's four types largely. And those types also correlate to aspects of the transaction cycle. So parts of a transaction. And that means you're going to be really strong at some part of the transaction more than others. And you really want to focus your energy on what am I really great at? Like, not just like just individual kind of things that you know how to do, but when you learn about the transaction cycle, you can go, this is where I'm really good. I've, John, you're an inventor and you come up with great ideas. Like I, I need people in my life who are going to come up with almost limitless ideas because I've got good ideas and I always thought I was pretty decent at that. But what I'm really good at is taking the one we land on for a specific situation and then being able to have other people see a future in that idea and have them take the actions needed to be able to have that idea live in the world, whether it be a business, just an event or whatever. So so understanding where that is also tells me fundamentally in that transaction, I'm going to need other people who are going to do the other aspects of the transaction. So when we think about producers who are going to fulfill on a lot of the actual work and action required to bring something to fruition. I have a lot of those people around me and what I do for my employer because I need people who are really going to take what we do and ensure it gets executed. And then on the other side of the transaction, we have judges and those are the people who are going to judge and assess. I get to work and, and work with a lot of those people too as CFOs and finance types and otherwise. And they really do help to make sure that what we've done actually meets the metrics of what we intended. So finding your place in all of those, in, in those types, and then starting to look and go, who could I work with that's going to be able to provide in the other areas of the transaction cycle that I really am not going to be strong at and I'm probably going to neglect left to my own devices? 
We will be right back with the rest of Trisha's story. But first, a reminder that the Influential You podcast is brought to you by Thrive. This is Influential You's self-guided training. Thrive is a professional self-development program that lets you learn at your own pace. Thrive members enjoy weekly live e-coaching sessions and an ever-expanding library of exclusive video lessons taught by our faculty, consultants, and industry experts. Sign up today and use promo code 30DAYS to get a Thrive self-guided training subscription for free for the first 30 days. Once again, that's coupon code 30DAYS. For links or to find out more, you can click the link in the show notes for this podcast or in the U.S. or Canada, you can text the word THRIVE to 805-262-9008. And we'll send you the registration link right to your mobile phone. Again, text the word THRIVE to 805-262-9008. You can cancel at any time. Now back to the interview. Very well said. Well, let's back up for a second. So just sort of go back to what are some of the philosophies or thoughts that guided you in the early days that you found out <laughs> you may be naive about? Um, certainly, I wouldn't ascribe this to a philosophy, but I would say that one of my attitudes was that I was going to do it my way. And, and, and I could, you know, I felt like I was generally, you know, I was, I was, you know, cooperative. It's not like I was, you know, I wasn't a person who wouldn't cooperate with others. I mean, I enjoy doing things with others. That's part of, that's part of my personality. But if I felt like it was my way, then I was going to do it my way. And I was going to do it regardless of whether anybody else felt like that was the right thing to do or not. And so I don't mean to sound like just a complete renegade and, and just impossible to direct or anything like that, but I can see it was just a subtext often. And so it, it wouldn't even be known by people around me for some time until we got to that thing, you know, yeah. whatever it was. And, and, and really, I think what was underneath all of that was just a sense that, well, I can't change the minds of anybody who's senior to me, you know, are like a really of like the institutional things that are, that are really trying to force me to, you know, to do whatever that thing is. Right. And so that to me was when I could see that all it takes is looking at what we're at work on together because I'm a part of the environment. That's another thing is just really understanding I'm a part of the environment for somebody else and somebody else is part of my environment as well. And so beginning to look to see how do I work even with a person that's in a position of authority. And it's funny for me to think about this now because I, I don't have that concern any longer. I think it's just a matter of what kind of value can I create for that person and what kind of value can I tell, you know, request from that person. And so it really just gets fundamentally down to part of being an ambitious adult is that you make offers, invitations, and requests. And so that really challenged me in situations where instead of just, you know, kind of bucking the system, if you will, choosing to do my own thing, you know, without perhaps even communicating that to anybody and just kind of doing my own thing, rather actually looking and saying, here's what my request is. And, you know, will you honor my request? And you know, I, now I realize that I have the opportunity to change a lot of culture. Even in large companies, I have the opportunity to do that just because I make a request or I, you know, I, I offer to do something or I invite them into doing something new that hasn't been done before. And what I've learned more than anything is that leaders have leaders too. And, and it's a breath of fresh air for leaders when they have somebody who's ambitious working with them, working for them who really does want to, who's looking to, what else can we do to make this different? What else can we do to make this a better environment? Or what else can we do to be more prosperous and hit our goals and do it with, you know, with more ease, that kind of stuff. So, so instead of feeling like I'm alone and doing it as a loner, I realized that the very thing that caused me to question whether we should be doing whatever it is, is something that can add value when I take the time just to make the request. Um, and I was just naive and accept that I, that I would do anything about it. So, um, so that was a really important learning for me. It's useful to, to stop here for a second because 
Um, you bring up one of the reasons that it, people love what we teach so much because in your example where you have some sort of authority and you, you know, you're going to have to go around the system or tolerate the system or the process or so forth. Oftentimes we dance with our environment in a way rather than transact with it. We, we simply resist it or we get mad at it or we protest or we, or we gather the troops and, you know, riot against it or we do nothing or, you know, there's so many different versions of that. Exactly. When we, yeah. when we don't, when we're naive to that, we aren't simply transactionally competent and can mm-hmm. make requests and so forth. It's, it's fantastic. Anything else uh, about that? No, it's just eye opening. I mean, it just gives you a place to transact from. And, you know, I think that's also the other thing is just really this whole notion of higher ecologies, knowing, you know, where you bring value and how you bring value to even higher ecologies. And just, you know, higher ecology is just one you'd rather be transacting with in some cases, you know, that might be able to really help me meet my chief aims. And I think, you know, I think one of the things that I used to do, John, was I, I would avoid really being ambitious around that for fear that I really couldn't bring value in that environment and almost for fear that I might find out I really wasn't valuable in that environment. Well said. <laughs> and and I just missed opportunities. I have no doubt of missed opportunities I've had just because I, I was operating like that. And just realizing that, you know, the worst that I can find out is that I, you know, I'm currently not valuable in an environment or to, you know, a specific ecology or to even just an individual person in, in that ecology. And that's that's just a matter of my usefulness. And my usefulness can change. Uh, I can do something about that. And so it's all a matter of, is it worth for me to really make a concerted effort in changing my usefulness in that specific environment or with that person to be able to become more useful? You know, so it just it's a question of how do I want to solve for meeting my chief aims? And I think it's the other thing I would say, especially for my personality type, to identify as being what we call a performer. And performers tend to say yes. We laugh about this, but it's very true. We'll say yes, and, and yes means maybe. It might happen, it might not. We mean yes in the moment, but it doesn't necessarily mean it, you know, that that'll be what it means into the future. And only because we really are presently like whatever is presently in front of us is the most important thing, like just in terms of our time orientation. And, and I don't mean to, to say that you can't count on my yes at this point, because you really can count on my yes at this point, because I'm trained now. I understand yeah. now how I have a tendency or how I might be compelled to say yes to things, whether it really was in my best interest or not. And that's the thing that I probably learned about my own naivety more than anything, too, is it's really checking in with what what are my aims? What's important to me? And what am I looking to accomplish? And getting rooted in that first and foremost and thinking from that perspective when I say yes or no and saying no a lot more often without losing the relationship in which I'm saying no, but being discerning and and not being difficult about that. And there are people that I have to say no with sometimes and maybe no again, but it may not always be a no. It may That may change and, and just understanding that we still have the relationship to, to be able to, you know, like whatever the individual situation is, that will, that may change. And so minding how I am with my relationships and just making sure that even if my answer is no, letting the person know that I value our relationship and I'm appreciative of, of the offers that they make to me. And I, I guess just really taking care of those relationships, but still being mindful of what I'm saying yes to and what I'm saying no to, because that's a commitment of my own resources. Yeah. whether it be money, time, energy, or anything else. So that's really important. Let's talk a little bit about how you discovered your, you were naive. And specifically, you know, oftentimes we will discover our naivete, you know, when we, we thought things were going so well and suddenly find out that <laughs> they aren't going well at all. What were some of those times for you? Oh, I think, I think early into my Fundamentals of Transaction program, we, we deal with money. And and, it's, and when I say deal with money, that's actually probably not accurate to say it that way. But money is a it, it is an unavoidable condition of life, it, just in terms of the way we transact for our basic needs. Even so, you've got to understand what you want your money to look like, and then really do the planning as to how you're going to get there. And I think that was the first moment where I was like, oh my gosh, these years I put in to working. And the dollars I can add up that I've made and how much of it really can I show for? 
right now in terms of saving that money, in terms of putting it to, to work where it's really going to, to benefit me. And so I just, let's put it this way. I have a lot more money in the bank now than I, than I used to. Uh, me too. Um, <laughs> when, uh, you know, when you said you discovered what it needed to look like, what do you mean by that? Do you mean how much money you needed? Can you? Uh, yeah, no, make- absolutely. We do. We, we do some thinking and, and we do, you know, accurate thinking. So none of this thinking like, oh, this should be good enough in round numbers. No, we I sat down to do, you know, a calculator and, and really thinking about by when would I like to retire or by when would I like to have the choice about whether I continue to work or not? I think that was a better question for me to frame because I just I have a lot of energy. I know there's things I, I want to work on for many years to come. So when I thought about by when do I want to have the freedom, whether I want to work or not, and then look at what would it take to get from where I am now in my retirement and my savings and everything else to get there and actually do the work for every year between here and that date to go, what would I need to do? What would I need to earn to be able to hit that goal? What would I need to earn and what would I need to save to be able to do that? And I, when I saw that, I thought, I'll be working for the rest of my life (laughs) if I don't do something to really start saving my money as well as improving my opportunities to to earn more money. So, and it's also looking at what kind of life do I want to live? When you looked at all of that and (laughs) and you saw the gap, what was your first thought? Do you remember? Oh, it's the worst feeling. (laughs) It's just a feeling like, what have I been doing? And it's like, and it's physical. It's a, it's a physical feeling in the body. Like it's like a pit in my stomach and just really wondering what have I been doing? Mm -hmm. And given that, I think you could look at a lot of things in my life at that point and go, oh, she's successful. She's done well, or, you know, this kind of thing. But success is a very funny word to use because really the only success that matters is how equipped are you to meet your personal aims? That's really the only success there needs to be measured. And I just wasn't on track for that. And I didn't have a plan for that either. So first, you've got to see the gap. And after you pick like yourself probably, back up. <laughs> yeah, and after I wallowed in it for yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it is, I, it is kind like, of confront. And, and uh, I, I know that many people who participate here, uh, one of the first things they deal with is how much money they need and how come that much and from now until when and what kind of mm-hmm. lifestyle and so forth. And oftentimes about the second or third session of our, our, the fundamentals of transaction program, people have the thought, (laughs) I'm screwed. Yeah. And so you're standing in front of this Canyon and what are your thoughts about how to now go forward? Do you know what to do or do you then throughout the rest of the program create a plan? But what happens next? Well, yeah. So from where I was in that moment, I, I, I didn't know what there was to do except to continue to do my program and continue to do what I was doing in the moment for work too. But I, I it's not, you know, there's big decisions we make in life for sure, but there's a, there's millions of small decisions you make in terms of where you're going to turn your attention, what you're going to choose to do in this moment, how you're going to prioritize the activities, what you know requests I'm going to make, what offers I'm going to make. And I just generally noticed I became more ambitious in the sense that I was now going to start going to work on some stuff. And I was just going, you know, even in the current environment I was in, I was going to start making more requests. I was going to, whether it be for, you know, a raise or whether it be looking for, you know, how much more value I could create in the environment I was in to be able to do what I was going to do or whether it was like trimming the budget now. I mean, there were lots of small things that turned into big, impactful things that I could do in the moment without having to go, well, pick the wrong career. So then that's one of the things even that in influence ecology, you, you will encourage us to do is just, just continue doing the work and the, cause a lot of it's inquiry, you know, you're really inquiring into what do you want? And I may not know that in that moment, I didn't know exactly what I wanted in that moment. You know, what I've found is inside the career and the area of specialized knowledge that I've been at you know, work on developing my entire career, there's plenty of opportunities for me to meet my aims. So it didn't take me having to re-engineer a whole other life to be able to meet my aims. I just had to spend enough time inquiring into it and doing the work 
to start to develop the practices that were going to be beneficial for me to meet my aims. A big part of what we're doing is not about, yes, it can equip you for making big decisions, but I think it it equips us a lot more for something that's so much more powerful, which is really developing the practices, just developing a practice and developing our competence and being able to transact with one another, with the environments that we're in, you know, one little decision at a time that that really we're at work on. And that's how we're encouraged to participate in our live events, but also just in our daily lives. So I think that that to me was the most valuable aspect of doing the study when I did it and still most valuable aspect of studying today with influence ecology. What's life like now? What does the future hold? Well, I am now married and that is a whole, that's a different life altogether and a really rewarding one. And I don't think there's any mistake that I I learned plenty of things through influence ecology that were never taught about relationships per se, but you know, we transact inside of our relationships as well. And I think that gives me the, just the really rewarding relationship that I have with my husband. And there are lots of adventures ahead for us. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the ocean. I'm a big ocean conservationist. And I'm also part of a, a nonprofit group that does shark conservation work. So being able to lead and join expeditions, doing that kind of work and sailing. Those things are the probably the most important things for my husband and I, in addition to the work that I do for Mercer today and just keep developing myself in in my leadership in creating the kind of environment that I want to work in and I think others want to work in as well and harness the good talent that I get to work with every day here. And, um, you know, just looking at what what fun things we can invent together that make create more income for us, how we may utilize the money that we have today to be able to invent other offers, to be able to do that, you know, just because we can, to be able to, you know, further meet our aims, you know, in the area of money and work and and even legacy down the road. So beginning to think about what my legacy will be. And I can't even tell you exactly what that's going to, I have no idea what that's going to look like at this point, but I can definitely say just at 40 years old today, there's a lot I have to give and to contribute in terms of what I'd like to make available for the world around me. And so it's just, it's a good time for me to be looking at that and really start thinking about that. And and uh, yeah, that'll be its own exploration. Today, our talk is from our annual member conference in 2015. Our global membership gathers every January for five days in a luxury resort somewhere in the world. Now, this talk, led by co-founder Kirkland Tibbles, is about the 2015 theme of the year, which was work. Work is one of the conditions of life we study. So work, the activity of life. In this talk, you're going to hear why so much of what we are doing may not be valuable to ourselves or to others. And he's joined on stage by Vice President Drew Knowles, in an example that may sound very familiar. What are you doing? And I want you to hear it like this. What you doing? And I want you to hear it like this. What are you doing? Like this. What are you doing? What are you doing? And what the F are you doing? No, but really, like, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing? What the heck are you doing? What the F are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? When you open your mouth. What are you doing? What are you doing? Quitting that job and starting that company. What are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you're doing? That's what we are going to focus on. 
this next year as a theme. We are going to. I can't wait to. Take a concentrated and focused look throughout the next year at my activity. We have a theme of the year called work. And work is what we are doing with our at the same time. Work is the activity of life. So I ask you again, and you'll hear it again, and again, and again, and again. And for some of you, you're going to get a phone call. And you'll go, <laughs> 805, I wonder who that is. Hey, Lisa, it's Kirkland. What are you doing? Or, hey, Lisa, I'm um, got a minute? Great. Just took a look at your metrics. Got a question for you. That's right. You hear that? Who's giggle? Who's laughing? <laughs> What's going to be my question? Yeah, just took a look at the metrics. Got just one little question. May sound familiar. Christopher, it is. What are you doing? Well, uh, gosh, you know, uh, well, first off, Kirkland, I'm so glad you called me. I just What are you doing? <clears throat> In all this activity, if interrupted in a moment, can you defend your activity? If challenged in any moment, like a fly is watching on the wall, lands on your shoulder, slaps your earlobe and says, Psst, what are you doing? Now, I've been experimenting with this for a while. And it has produced some rather substantial agitation. There are people who have had wake-up calls just based on a rigorous, lengthy conversation where mostly all I did was ask that question until they got to, they had no stinking idea what they were actually doing. So I thought I'd give you an example of what that might look like. Would you like to hear one? This is the present day interpretation of one of those moments. So there I was in uh, Marina Del Rey in Los Angeles, sitting on a three foot concrete fence on the phone to Kirkland. And just before that, I'd got a phone call driving in my car from Ojai to Los Angeles, almost, almost there. And it was Kirkland. And he said, what you doing? It was that version. And I said, ah, oh, well, I'm uh, in Los Angeles and I'm here again. I was here last weekend and I'm going to go to this networking event this weekend. And it was why I was in Los Angeles. Ojai was had invited me at the conference two years ago. Why don't you come study for a few months in, in Ojai? Okay. And build influence ecology at the same time. So I'm going to these networking events. And so then Kirkland says, what are you doing? Well, you know, I'm this last Saturday I met this guy and then we had breakfast and he's this big Australian uh, marketing guy and I met these guys and Kirkland said, okay, but what are you doing? I said, well, well you know, this weekend I'm going to go to another one and then there's this guy speaking and I think this time I, I, I'm for sure someone will want to request an application and, and, you know, we'll get lots of business out of it uh, at this next, next one. And then on Sunday, I'm going to go to a barbecue and they're doing this. And Monday, I'm sure Daryl has got me going to this other networking event. And Yeah, but what are you doing? So then Kirkland proceeded to tell me his view of networking and uh, also asked me, well, how many people actually asked you about influence ecology at the one last weekend and how many people actually 
you know, have you called since that wants to do influence ecology? Oh, wow. I mean, it, it's all possibilities at the moment and I'm sure we're going to get, you know, cause I really knew that how I was going to grow influence ecology over those three months was I was going to drive to Los Angeles every week <laughs> to go to these networking events. So I proceeded to ask the question again. <laughs> so what are you doing? Uh, and it kept going like that. And there was a moment when I started to get really agitated and so I did, I did this thing where I said, well, hang on a second. Just where are you? Where, where I'm calling into an environment. Let me just check the environment. So are you where we can have a conversation? And he told yeah, me where just, he was. I'm, I'm, I'm about to, I'm just about to go up to my friend's apartment, but I'm sitting here on this concrete fence and Marina Del Rey looking out over a, I think it's a Trader Joe's and in the car park. It's sure. I'll keep, I'll keep talking. I'm listening. I don't know what you're getting at, but and then I'm I, listening. Then I proceeded to go down the old road where it was. Well, Drew, would you like for me to have this conversation with you taking care of you? Or would you prefer I take the bark off? And Drew generously said, take the bark off. And I asked Drew what the F he was doing. What are you doing? And I pressed him and I pressed him and I pressed him until he finally got in living color that he didn't know his ass from a stopwatch. He was just out there doing. Because somewhere along the way, we got this incredible bit of wisdom that when there's nothing left to do, go do something. And make sure you're really excited while you're doing it. If you'd like to know more about us, go to InfluentialU.Global and explore our courses, consulting, and conferences. We offer a four-year curriculum for those seeking an advanced experience. However, if you're brand new to Influential U, we highly recommend that you start with Thrive. It's our self-guided training. Thrive is a self-guided program that allows you to learn at your own pace. Thrive members enjoy weekly live e-coaching sessions and an ever-expanding library of exclusive video lessons with our faculty, thought leaders, and other industry experts. You'll get proven proprietary tools to accurately assess your career and develop a realistic strategy to achieve your aims faster. Your membership also includes chat access to our faculty, plus discounts to our transformative conferences. If you sign up today and use promo code 30DAYS, you'll get a free 30-day test drive of Influential Use Thrive program. That code, once again, 30DAYS, and you may cancel at any time. Thank you so much for listening today. You'll find new episodes on our website, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, so you may easily share this episode with others. You can also subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or any place you listen to quality podcasts. Next week on the Influential You podcast, we revisit Marcus Bell. Now, he's a graduate of our entire curriculum at Influential You and an American music producer, composer, and musician, and a good friend, and I hope you'll join us. You may check out our show notes for links to connect with our guests, plus links to websites, books, or special downloads that we may have talked about on today's episode. This season's podcasts were made possible by the Influential You staff, faculty, and our wonderful members all around the world, with a special thanks to our executive producer, Tyson Crandall, Joey Anderley, our in-studio producer, thank you, Joey, with contributions from John Patterson, Michael Teehee, Daryl Anderley, Paul West, and Liz Smiley, and a special thanks to our guest, Trisha Tyler. The Influential You podcast is produced in Ventura, California, and this episode was originally recorded in September of 2016. The podcast theme is by Chris Standring, entitled Fast Train to Everywhere, and if you haven't yet offered a rating or review, please take a moment to go to the iTunes or your podcast app and let us know what you think. This helps us more than you know. We'll see you next time on the Influential You Podcast.